And our guests are Mark Leonard, who's the head of European Council of Foreign Relations. Welcome. Paola Mattei, professor at University of Milan. Anna Lurman from Variety of Democracy, VDEM Institute. William Dobson, co-editor of the Journal of Democracy. And Carolina Vigura, who's here with me at, at the theater, who's sociologist and social philosopher at Warsaw University, uh, as well as member of the board of Cultura Liberalna, who is the organizer of tonight's event. My name is Darius Rosiak, and I, I host a podcast called State of the World Report, which is in Polish. So if you speak Polish, you can listen to it. Uh, as, as the title of our discussion suggests, we'll, we'll discuss the state of democracy in this period of, of extreme uh, political and social tensions and, and turbulences. And uh, I, as a journalist, I go back to the beginning of the year, actually to March. And, uh, I, and I wonder if you remember what was the main topic at that time. It was the Australian fires very dramatic and tragic events, uh, albeit only a prelude to what was going to, to happen next. Uh, and we, we seem to believe, I think many of us believe that we are living in, in some kind of a defining moment, uh, one of those defining moments for a generation uh, defining for our individual lives, for, for economy, for uh, for our relationships, for the way we construct our relations with people, as well as carry our politics. And, and this is, especially this last thing will be the, the main subject of our de debate, our discussion. How is democracy, especially liberal democracy, because as we know, and we have known for some time, there are other kinds of democracies as well, illiberal democracy being the kind of main pretender to take over from liberal democracy. How, how is democracy faring in this time of troubles? We are checking the limits of the rule of law and the intrusion of executive powers in everyday lives of citizens. Monitoring, introducing restrictions of movement, social and political activities, all, all the things that until very recently we took for granted. Uh, in liberal democracies. And one other thing which I think is important to mention maybe in this introduction, that politics has not been suspended, contrary to what some people may think, uh, from Belarus to Lebanon to the US, as well some, as some European capitals and, and perhaps Paris being the last great example with thousands of people showing their anger uh, after the horrific murder of a school teacher beheaded in, in, in the name of Allah, it all shows that politics is still going on. We have movements like the Yellow Vest, like BLM, Black Lives Matter, like Me Too, they're all, they, this is all continuing. So it shows that political and social change is still going on as usual perhaps even more during this trying time for all of us. And I will ask the panelists, what is the, what is the balance of all this, of all these changes? To begin with, we asked Jan Werner Miller, Prince from Princeton University, as well as Wissenschaftskolleg zu Berlin. I did it, yes. I don't speak German, but... You made I, it. I, I made it to kick off the debate. So uh, he's not with us, but he recorded a message for all of us, uh, and he, which we will present to you in a, in a minute. Um, and just a quick uh, note, quick mention, Jan Werner Miller's last book entitled Fear and Freedom for a Different Kind of Liberalism will be published in Polish by Cultura Liberalna, and I'm sure Cultura Liberalna will keep you posted on that as well. So perhaps uh, we'll we'll uh, listen to and, and uh, watch what Jan Werner Miller uh, will be able to tell us. 
allow me to offer you two sets of remarks about the fate of liberalism in our era. As everybody knows, uh, in the past couple of years, liberalism has often been attacked as a kind of luxury item for the most privileged, for the powerful, Can we for hear the it? winners. Uh, liberalism, it's often been said, is for those who are definitely not among the left behind, the ones left out. It's not for, as a somewhat cliched phrase often has it, the losers of globalization or the losers of European integration. Allow me to counter that argument with two different sets of points. The first one is more empirical, the second one is more theoretical. First of all, the picture that we often get today, the contrast as in David Goodhart's very influential formulation between on the one hand, anywheres who can flourish anywhere and somewheres who are somehow rooted in their surroundings, usually in the countryside, as opposed to supposedly cosmopolitan liberals who hail from cities, but who could really work in any city if they wanted to, in many ways is very misleading. For one thing, the immediate short circuiting between a particular social position and then holding particular philosophical beliefs or values is often simply not there. It doesn't follow that those who happen to be particularly mobile, therefore necessarily are also particularly liberal, let alone cosmopolitan in any sense that is not completely superficial as in, oh, I can eat sushi tonight and tomorrow we'll have Mexican. If it means anything like, let's say, a commitment to global justice, I dare say that it's sometimes the most immobile who have the most ambitious normative agendas, and sometimes those who are actually highly mobile by no means are necessarily committed to such ambitious ideals. As my fellow panelist Ivan Krastev pointed out recently, if you know it was all about mobility being a precondition for being a genuine cosmopolitan, how come that Immanuel Kant, of all people, was such a great cosmopolitan, given that he didn't really do a lot of traveling, but in fact hardly ever left Königsberg slash Kaliningrad? Secondly, and even more important, those who are portrayed as the most privileged cosmopolitan liberals, in many ways, are actually not the real elites, the real decision-making elites. The elites in administration, in finance, in the economy, for the most part, remain deeply nationally rooted. It's simply not true that, I dare say, you or I or some of my students could simply pack up and decide that, oh, tomorrow we'll join the French elite because, hey, we are anywheres. No, in many ways, the really important elites remain deeply nationally rooted. And more important still, while we can all think of sort of counterexamples, supposed liberals from Silicon Valley, these sorts of elites also very often remain deeply conservative, certainly when it comes to their economic preferences. As has been shown many times, the let's say 0.01% in the United States actually are very supportive of Donald Trump because his economic policies align very well with their own, for the most part, very libertarian, but certainly not cosmopolitan liberal attitudes. Long story short, the often very uncritical acceptance of the anywheres and somewheres picture by liberals, liberals who feel that they need to be contrite, that you know, they've done something wrong in the last couple of years, that they should be more self-critical, all of which of course are very laudable intentions, but this kind of uncritical and in many ways all too facile acceptance of what ultimately is an empirical, empirically misleading picture of the world has for the most part only had really one particular effect. And the effect has not been that those who are left behind, those in the countryside, all of a sudden say, oh great, liberals are changing their minds. That's not what's happening. What is happening really is that for shorthand, right-wing authoritarian populists will have succeeded 
in basically moving the political battle to culture and to convince people that the most powerful, the most oppressive, the most privileged, those who cause their misery are intellectuals, teachers, professors, journalists, etc., etc. And those who actually, as I said a minute ago, remain the most consequential elites, essentially are not blamed and don't even enter the picture as long as the picture is mainly about culture war. That was the first set of remarks. Let me move on swiftly to a couple of more general observations about liberalism, and I hope you will see how they relate to my attempt to counter the kind of anti-liberal cultural war narrative. Obviously, liberalism is a very complicated tradition in the history of political thought, and I'm not pretending that anybody could do justice to it in about two and a half minutes. But taking an inspiration from the American political theorist Judith Schlar, I want to draw a broad distinction between, on the one hand, liberalism as a distinct ethical ideal. In other words, the attitude where one says the best possible life is an autonomous life, but also a life where you try out what John Stuart Mill called experiments in living, where in a certain way it's true that it's about maximizing diversity, where it's true that the more variety life has, the more you taste, let's say, different cultures, the better life you have. I mean, that's not a caricature. Some liberals really have this ideal, and we can certainly debate to what extent that is an attractive one, or as critics might sometimes say, it's a slightly narcissistic, it's all about me, it's all about my experiences sort of idea about life. But that's only one understanding of liberalism, certainly something that was very prevalent in the 19th century with figures like Mill or Wilhelm von Humboldt. But of course, there's another understanding, what Judas Schlar called the liberalism of rights. And that is quite different from this idealization of autonomy. That is really the liberalism from which the weakest and the most vulnerable are likely to benefit the most. And where this picture of liberalism as something for the privileged and the most powerful absolutely doesn't fit. And last thing I wanna, I wanna say, those who today are often dismissed as advancing something called identity politics, where it's often said, oh, one of the great, great mistakes of liberals is that they now you know, have invested in all these ever more fragmented minorities and their particular concerns. And they're again, maybe overly selfish or narcissistic demands for recognition. It's very important, I think, to emphasize that when you look at the actual instances of what is derided as identity politics, so let's say Me Too in the United States or Black Lives Matter, it's simply not true that these are movements that are primarily about the need to recognize highly scurrilous, particular, almost incomprehensible experiences and identities, such that, according to the critics, society would break up into ever more fragmented little communities. It's a complete caricature. What these groups demand is something that actually should be and is, I think, completely comprehensible for all of us. A demand not to be harassed, let alone to be shot by the police, or a demand not to be harassed, let alone be raped by a powerful man. This is not something that you know, others can, cannot possibly get their heads around. It precisely revolves around the liberalism of basic rights. And what in the times of the pandemic and COVID, I think has become even clearer because COVID after all has been a kind of X-ray of our societies that has exposed something that was already there, but maybe some of us can see it even more clearly now is the systematic vulnerabilities of some of these, of some of these groups. Of course, initially there was a moment in the spring when people said, oh, pandemic affects everybody by, by definition. And on one level that remains true. On another level, of course, we've also found that those who are relatively privileged can now, again, if I may go back to the 0, 0.1%, go to their second homes, their third homes, 
uh, their yachts, you know, if they really want to self-isolate, then the real question is, do you bring the staff or not? I mean, worries that many others don't really have in our, in our day and age. But those who were already most vulnerable and, 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 and most exposed to the pathologies of our increasingly unequal societies, they now have their rights even more at risk. And I think liberals, rather than remaining entirely on the defensive and you know, apologizing for things which they may well have done wrong, I'm not saying they're blameless, but to not to instead of instead of basically buying into this cultural war narrative, should reassert the liberalism of rights and insist that rights are not a privilege, are not a luxury item, but are most essential for the most vulnerable in society. Thank you for your attention. Let, let's start with uh, uh, Professor Paola Mattei then. Uh, if, if you look at Europe nowadays, there is virtually zero nation within the EU at least, and I think it's, it's even, even larger than that, uh, who are happy with the response of their governments uh, to the crisis. And this includes the, uh, the democratic societies uh, in which uh, the value of democracy is very strong. How do you explain this, this phenomenon? And does it have to do only with the chaos and the necessary uncertainty about how to deal with COVID? Or is there anything more to it? Thanks, uh, Darius, um, for the question and for having me on the panel. Well, I think the politics of the pandemic um, for central governments in, in Europe is very often the politics of blame games. Um, governmental responses to pandemics in the past if we look at how governments have managed uh, Ebola or the swine flu, um, we realize that generally these policy responses that governments have um, put in place to manage pandemics have most often be, been viewed through policy failures, through the lenses of failures rather than successes. So I'm saying this because I am not uh, entirely surprised that with the coronavirus, um, any response really that governments put forward to manage will be seen in critical terms and with lenses that uh, focus on what governments were not able to do, what went wrong. Um, I think that um, if we put this um, COVID pandemic into perspective and we look also at the ways in which the discourses with past uh, pandemics were, um, were um, um, put forward, then we can say that policy failures is really what the narrative is, is, is focusing on. Um, having said that, However, I have to say that, well, I'm based in Italy, as, as, you, as, you, as you said at the beginning, and um, well, Italy was the first Western democracies hit by the crisis. I personally woke up one day, I live in Milan, which was at the heart of the um, COVID uh, spread. I woke up uh, and um, one day and I thought it was a bad dream. It happened rapidly, uh, it happened in a most unprecedented way. Italy had one of the um, most strict lockdown. Um, I was not able to walk outside my home for a month. So I was actually confined at home. It was very, very hard. Now yet, I'm saying this because the story of Italy is curious. Um, the COVID crisis has helped to increase trust in government. If we compare the pre-COVID um, positive opinion uh, of Italians about the government, it was around 42% in December 2019. 
and it um, increased to 71 percent the favorable ratings uh, of the government in February and March, precisely during these times when restrictions became tougher. So um, I would argue that, look, I'm, I'm not quite sure, perhaps Italy is an anomaly. However, um, I think um, uh, the, we should not, um, in my view, uh, understate uh, the effect that the centralization of power um, demanded by the pandemic had on the institutional transformation of, uh, for instance, uh, prime ministers and the role of the executive. Um, so in my view, for instance, the, the, the story of Giuseppe Conte, who is our prime minister, it's quite interesting. Um, well, it is not personal in my view, but again, it's institutional. Giuseppe Conte was uh, uh, not known. I mean, he was new to politics. Uh, two years ago when he was uh, appointed prime minister but yet he has established himself during the pandemic as a man of the hour um, he has received support for these european colleagues and has reached in italy record levels of popularity and trust um, also from an historical perspective he scores 60 percent of favorable opinion now in october just recently um, again, compared to 40% or even lower than the pre-COVID. So I just, I just, um, I'm just like to, um, again, put this argument that uh, um, citizens in Europe are unhappy about uh, how governments are dealing with the crisis in perspective. Um, I think that it seems, however, and I have to say this, that uh, um, democracies are struggling um, more than authoritarian regimes in managing the pandemic. Uh, and that's because, uh, um, in my view, uh, crisis management in European democracy is not about capacity and government's capacity, but it's actually about the legitimacy. And the two needs to go hand in hand um, in, in a democratic system. Um, so to me, I mean, the question of, restrictions and the challenge to liberalism is actually also a question of what restrictions are legitimate and have a legitimate aim such as protecting um, people's health um, the restrictions uh, sometimes you know are grounded um, in uh, national laws I mean, the emergency state, you know, which is very much discussed, contested in Italy, but in many European countries as well. Um, it was just prolonged now uh, a few days ago until January in Italy, and it was contested. It was debated in Parliament. But I think we shouldn't really forget the emergency state in most European countries as a legal basis in national laws. Um, so having said that, I also believe that um, the first wave of coronavirus has challenged um, democratic uh, culture in this country and in many parts of Europe. I think that there has been a process of, in my view, democratic backsliding especially during the first wave of coronavirus. But again, I would argue um, that this democratic backsliding is an unintended consequence rather than you know, um, a voluntary abuse of power by the executive. It's an unintended consequence of the politics of blame game. Um, well, in Italy, for, I, will, I can speak from my own experience in this country, at least, I think there were three major really issues uh, with um, the ways in which um, democratic institutions function in the first, during the first wave. The first one is that uh, we had, we as citizens, had limited transparency of information um, about the virus. And I think uh, Jan Werner Müller and also Timothy Gartonash have uh, uh, both um, uh, emphasized the importance of uh, um, pluralistic information, transparent information. It seems to me a foundational core of, of a democratic system. Well, even today, uh, the government in Italy uh, does not, um, is not inclined to publish the documents of the scientific medical committee 
um, that were produced in January and February. So they're not publicly released and they continue to be protected by secrecy. And that's, I find, problematic. Secondly, measures were taken through executive decrees with very limited, if at all, involvement and discussion in Parliament. Um, we had one executive decree every two weeks, every two, three weeks, the Prime Minister would issue an executive decree, sometimes not involving regional governments, local governments, and that also I find problematic in a parliamentary system. Thirdly, and I think it was mentioned in the previous panel by I think Fuchs and others, um, in Italy, and I believe this is somewhat also reflects other countries' approaches, the Prime Minister delegated significant decision-making authority to scientists, to medical scientists, epidemiologists, I mean a committee, a technical medical committee was set up, and uh, to the extent that political deliberation and discussion was avoided um, in favour of scientists' advice. Um, I find that uh, this was also part of the blame game. And um, so very often decisions were presented to the public, even the most strictest decision as not walking uh, um, out of, of, your, of your home, were presented as the scientists told us that uh, that's the best thing to do. So, and this is an ongoing process. Um, almost every day, Italian citizens are um, presented with um, uh, data, uh, statistical modeling, algorithms uh, that are all useful uh, if we use them um, skillfully, intelligently. But sometimes I think it is problematic when decision, political decisions, are the outcome exclusively of this expertocracy. Um, I do believe, uh, as liberals do, that politics is about participation and, and deliberation uh, and cannot be delegated in an unprecedented way um, to um, medical experts as good as and as important as, of course, their advice is to inform policies. Um, just the last point uh, is, is that for me, I mean, one of the most pressing questions, and I'm afraid it's still premature, I don't have yet a definite answer to that, is really whether this pandemic is a temporary uh, freeze of the um, democratic functioning, say, of parliament, which is an important central actor in the Italian parliamentary democracy, and then we will just return to the, um, to the uh, normal functioning of parliament, or whether we are heading towards a new scenario in which parliamentary debates is, um, is less central to, to the process. So, Will the pandemic really be transient uh, or will it cause some institutional transformations to our democratic, parliamentary, um, European democracies? Um, will COVID, will the pandemic be uh, exacerbating and intensifying you know, the process of, if you like, self-exclusion that many legislative bodies in European countries have actually adopted. Um, politicians do during the pandemic, populists, for instance, continue to prefer social media and Twitter to parliamentary debate and parliamentary opposition. So it's a process of self-exclusion from scrutiny, from controlling what, what governments do. Um, and I think, again, Professor Gartonache uh, pointed to the fact that populists are just not uh, good at doing uh, real things, are, are dealing with real solutions, and that we can see also in, their in the methods of their parliamentary um, opposition. So I do hope that uh, we can uh, reflect um, on these, on some of these uh, issues in our panel. And I think the functioning of parliament uh, will be, uh, to me, a very important uh, question for the future. 
I, I do um, wish and hope that uh, national parliaments will be able to scrutinize, to control executive decisions, even at times of unprecedented times of a pandemic like um, COVID. And I do hope that they will not um, self-exclude um, themselves from contributing to this process. Um, just coming back to Italy, um, just a few days ago, I mean, parliaments were certainly much more involved in the debate about prolonging the emergency state, for instance, than it was during the first wave when it was just announced with no parliamentary discussion. Um, this has changed a lot right now as we face this second wave. So I, I'm, I, I feel I'm optimistic, though in a very timid way, about the fact that um, institutions are learning and institutions can learn um, and avoid the mistakes which were made during the, the first wave. Thank you, uh, Professor Mattei. Mattei. Uh, it, it, very interesting thoughts on the role of experts and the relationship between the experts and, uh, and the governments, as well as your last uh, thought on the on the functioning of, of, of parliaments. Basically, the question is, will, will Twitter push parliaments out of existence? That's the, the, because this is what's happening more and more. Uh, a question to Mark Leonard. Uh, when we looking at, at the situation in the, and, and this is also what Professor Mattei mentioned, uh, it, in most countries, it is not a ripe time for the parties that we like to call populist parties. And especially if we're talking about extreme parties like uh, AFD in, uh, in Germany or, or uh, National Front or National Alliance, whatever you call them in France or, or some other parties of that sort. Why do you think uh, COVID and how COVID is different from the financial crisis or from immigration crisis in this respect? I think it's one of the big surprises maybe of the, the crisis. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes Great. I can. I hope but, everybody can. No, I, I think that at the beginning of the crisis, people argued that this was maybe a moment for authoritarians and that Europeans and liberals uh, would end up uh, coming out of this weaker and, and, and badly and that this, you know, in a way, this that, that just as there could be a long COVID for people's health and for the economies, there could be a long COVID for, for democracy. But I think in many ways, there are reasons to be quite optimistic about the impact of COVID on our democratic systems. And maybe can sort of think about three dimensions uh, of that, um, which are uh, some of the axes with, with, within which um, democratic societies have been put under enormous pressure in recent times. And essentially, I think that the digital revolution has forwarded, uh, has meant that our societies are more segregated, tend to have a politics more based around identity and envy, and um, leads to a sense of a loss of control amongst ordinary citizens. And those things were, were like a virus which was undermining um, our societies and our democratic systems and which were in a way significantly enhanced just by digital technologies and the impact that they have on our, on our, on our societies. And I think if you take each of those three areas, on the one hand, they have, uh, you know, been part and parcel of the political response to, to COVID. So uh, segregation is obviously something which is endemic to COVID. It splits the, the young from the old. Uh, it doesn't affect all countries equally. It doesn't affect all regions equally. Uh, there are class differences. Jan van Muller talked about rich people being able to go off to their second homes. Um, but uh, the same is true with, with envy, where, which has been a kind of important part of our, of our politics and a lot of uh, distributional struggles between different groups and anger around that. And there is a widespread sense of a, of a sort of loss of control, which is the sort of third dimension, 
because this is something which came from outside, which is depriving of us of our individual liberty and making people feel um, uh, that they're dealing with shadowy forces over which they have very little uh, purchase. And in, in a way, those are the sort of three forces which have which have been the fuel which has powered the populist counter-revolution in recent times. You know, segregation, envy, and a loss of control. And their politics has been about coming up with a, an alternative to that. But what's interesting about this crisis is, is that in many ways, COVID has actually tilted the scales even more firmly in the other direction. So as well as showing that uh, everyone's in a different position and, and, and furthering this segregation of our societies, I think the essence of COVID-19, unlike the global financial crisis, unlike the refugee crisis, is a message about interdependence and the fact that actually uh, our security, our health is ultimately bound up with other people and that the only way of solving it is in fact through common action. And that's both true about the, the sort of reinvigoration of faith in our domestic institutions, whether it's healthcare uh, systems, but also uh, a revalorization of segments of society that were not sufficiently uh, valued beforehand. So the, the sort of lionizing of key workers, health healthcare workers, people who run supermarkets and shops and, uh, and keep societies going. And I think that the fact that domestic institutions and governments have uh, actually been forced to prop up these segments of society that so many of our workers are now being supported by the state um, and by our common endeavor is something which has actually created a new civic awareness which was really not there before covid in many societies particularly some of the most individu individualistic countries in europe like the uk i think the second element about uh, about the politics of envy which is a, a, a product of comparison and social comparison um this epidem epidemic uh of envy which facebook and instagram and other kind of social media platforms have unleashed also had the sort of positive um uh counter uh, example during the covid era which is the the politics of comparison and the fact that every single government in the world has been dealing with similar issues and their track record has been portrayed in daily newspapers and tweets and on TV broadcasts in comparison with everyone else. And there is nowhere to hide for, for governments that are not doing very well. And that has actually been an enormous source of accountability in, in different countries. There, you know, in the US, we who knows what's going to happen in, in November, but it's certainly true that the comparison of, of uh, American uh death rates economic uh responses with with what's going on in the rest of the world will be an important factor in the election uh in new zealand on the other hand where uh jacinda arden has just won a, a kind of landslide victory um it's also very much to do with this politics of comparison in the uk one of the most uh solipsistic and introverted uh, political systems at the moment, which is going through Brexit, um, it's been impossible for the government to hide from the international comparisons, to avoid comparison with with uh, what Angela Merkel has been doing in Germany and other players have been doing. So I, I do think that there has been a, a big uh, injection of accountability uh, into our systems. And that that is also one of the things which has weakened a lot of the the populist parties that you're talking about because where they are in power they haven't tended to do a particularly good job um but also they're not 
channeling things which which feel like sort of uh, solutions to them and then on the final thing which is this question about the loss of control um i think one of the biggest problems that liberals have in terms of their domestic legitimacy has been a, a unilateral disarmament in the face of a lot of the the biggest ills which we face as society and the fact that uh, as liberals we often end up on the wrong side of different arguments and i think the fact that the democratic governments and liberals in different places have actually um realized that uh laissez faire is neither an option in economic terms or in political terms and that there is a hierarchy of rights that people have and the most important right is the right to survive and to be healthy and well and that that's led to a kind of rethinking of the role of the state amongst um uh, amongst uh, liberal people uh, is something which will actually um i think contribute to a, a revitalization of liberalism um as a, a serious political force because it's reminded people that the the foundation of uh, the other rights is is the right to, to to life and to be protected um and uh that is uh is, a, is an important and a healthy lesson which i think covid has taught us so i kind of end up at this sort of early stage in the covid crisis thinking that it is plausible that the covid will will be a kind of catastrophe and that you'll have a long covid which undermines our democracy which reinforces segregation and envy and a, a sense of a loss of control but it's equally plausible that we'll have a, a sort of democratic spring of covid where uh the crisis ends up creating a bigger sense of, of interdependence amongst people uh leads to more accountability um and real accountability not just procedural accountability and also a, a bigger sense of what of what sovereignty means um and some interesting debates about how it's exercised because actually one of the the most interesting things that that will happen i think as we move onwards is is bigger debates both about how you can actually ensure people's safety but also how you go about legitimating it and we've seen some some really powerful counter reactions to um things like the use of algorithms and artificial intelligence to to decide how to do things which has also been uh, i think uh, an important democratic moment in a lot of our societies mark and in in the follow up to to what mark has just said uh perhaps one other thing worth mentioning covid is a great equalizer in in normal times uh, people who decide they are isolated from the consequences of their decisions and their mistakes, are they not? And, and in these times, it is kind of paradoxical that the three uh, world leaders who were most vocal in denying uh, the consequences of COVID have, have fallen ill to it. So perhaps that's, uh, that's also a... a, a well, worth looking at at least. And uh, turning to uh, Anna Lurman, uh, I have a question from a, from a viewer, which I think may be a good starting point uh, to, to you. Democracy is particip participation, but how does it look like in the era of mass media when cacophony uh, is more important and what is said is less important than how it is said uh, where does democracy end and uh, uh, mediocrity begins i would also follow up with this do people question in your opinion and if you're, from your findings do, do people question in this time in this time of COVID, do they question the foundations of democracy and is it an important phenomenon is it an important issue that can be uh, 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 that can be uh, polled, basically, and studied. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so uh, first of all, thanks, thanks for having me here at this uh, very exciting um, debate. So I think indeed, uh, and this has, has been discussed already a bit also in, in earlier panels, um, 
looking at the media is really the key to understand uh, democracy uh, because traditional, particularly as liberals, we have, we have mainly been concerned with media freedom, with sort of allowing um, space uh, for journalists um, to uh, report about uh, without constraints from the government. But what we're currently seeing is that um, particularly in social media, this is often uh, abused to spread disinformation, to spread particularly in the context of COVID-19 um, conspiracy theories um, and, uh, and also hate, uh, which then fuels populist and far-right uh, movements uh, and polarization also in society. So we have an issue indeed here with, um, with sort of um, uh, the, the challenge that uh, a lot of citizens uh, access uh, only free information these days online, uh, where they can freely access um, the wildest conspiracy theories, um, uh, QAnon and the likes, uh, but then they are stopped uh, by a paywall uh, when it comes to quality journalism, when it comes to actually uh, making sense uh, of the world. And in that sense, I also um, uh, want to sort of put a bit of uh, water into the wine that, uh, that Mark has been providing here, sort of as a more optimist take on how uh, COVID-19 can be good for democracy. Normally, I'm always the optimist, but let me, let me take the role of the pessimist then here tonight. Um, so you said that um, COVID-19 could be sort of an ejection of accountability because uh, we can read about the numbers, how our governments fare uh, every day, you know, looking, looking at all these graphs about COVID-19 statistics. Yeah, we can do that, but only if we believe in them, right? So I think sort of what, what COVID-19 has done now is, is sort of um, accelerated a process that we've already seen in, in our societies that we sort of live in in different realities, right? We live in a reality uh, of people who believe in science, who believe in, in experts, who believe in public deliberation. And, uh, in, uh, and then there's another reality of people uh, that mistrust all elites, including the media, including academia, including all these numbers that you say would bring accountability to governments, right? So it's sort of, uh, and now sort of we have, um, we have uh, on the one hand and in most societies, also in my home country of Germany, these are is the large majority citizens that, um, that uh, sort of uh, understand the, the threat that comes along with COVID-19, but then you have others who just don't believe in it. So those who believe in the virus and those who don't believe in the virus. And in this kind of um, separation of realities, this polarization, because it really, this is really a, a key, uh, like sort of one of the most vicious issues that can fuel polarization in society, because it's basically about, about our our right to life, right? Where we're afraid that because somebody doesn't follow the rules, they might threaten our own um, yeah, personal integrity, our own um, health. Uh, this is really something that, 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 um, that enhances these dividing, slide, dividing lines. So I think this is sort of one uh, reason uh, for pessimism, maybe a bit like what Paola was saying, that there's some sort of like an involuntary, voluntarily or involuntary process of how COVID-19 can uh, fuel um, backsliding, fuel uh, the decline of democracy. And then um, uh, the second um, way how this can happen, this is something that we've studied now in depth here at the Varieties of Democracy Institute. We have looked at uh, 144 countries uh, and how they have dealt with the pandemic since uh, it started. And what we've been looking at here is sort of if uh, COVID-19 related measures are really in line with democratic standards. Uh, and of course, because we were looking at 144 countries, these standards had to be relatively, relatively coerced. But we took them from the ICPR um, mainly, uh, the International Covenant for Civil and Political Rights, uh, where uh, you can clearly um, sort of take, take from that um, uh, emergency measures uh, can um, deviate from certain political rights and standards, but only if it's really necessary, only if these measures are proportionate uh, and if they're non-discriminatory, right? And we, including necessary also means that they are time limited. 
And we have seen uh, countries, uh, and here I want to sort of contradict what Paola was saying earlier, we have seen countries that have used COVID-19 related measures intentionally to undermine uh, democracy, to accelerate a process of democratic backsliding. Hungary is certainly one of the cases. We've also identified other countries uh, uh, in Europe, like Serbia, also many countries outside of Europe, Sri Lanka, India, El Salvador, particularly extreme case, uh, Mexico, also South Africa, where disproportionate enforcement of um, emergency measures has, has really uh, contributed to what we call pandemic backsliding. So um, this is the second way the, the COVID-19 crisis can be used to undermine democracy. And the third way um, is related a lot to one of the key uh, elements of how populists rule, namely that they spread disinformation. Um, and we've seen that in, uh, in the US, in uh, Brazil, in many African countries where governments said, oh, you sort of you have, just have to take uh, a special tonic um, and then it will be okay. Uh, and uh, Belarus is another case, of course, right? So we've seen uh, we've seen government-sponsored disinformation campaigns that uh, that are sort of meant to distort reality, meant to strengthen uh, populists. And unfortunately, uh, in many places, including the US, uh, this uh, seems to work. Thank you very much. Uh... The, w one other thing in, in the follow-up to, to, uh, uh, to what Anna has just said, because you, you were talking about disinformation, and I think there's an in interesting question from a, uh, uh, from a viewer. Uh, or, or this information comes from within the governments, but it comes from without as well. And if you're looking at what, mm. what was happening with China, for instance, and Russia to some extent, mm. uh, and as the viewer suggested, has contributed to the deaths of thousands of people in Europe. And here's a question about the European institution. How should European democracies, and also maybe the European Union, change their attitude towards authoritarian China? Is a lasting change possible at all? Is COVID going to change the attitude of countries like Hungary, Italy, uh, or other or other countries, or Greece, for instance, towards Russia, or uh, people who see China as this large amount of money that may come into Poland, for instance. Do you think that there is a possibility that this may change? And I'm just uh, giving any one of you a chance to answer that. <laughs> who would like to answer? Okay, Mark. I think you... it. No, I think it already has changed. Uh, we've done a lot of polling uh, on attitudes towards mm -hmm. China and at the public opinion uh, there's been a massive shift against China, but also there's been a, a really important political awakening in lots of member states as a result of uh, seeing the Chinese government being willing to blackmail countries and to threaten to restrict uh, their imports of medical supplies and masks because of what their government said about Taiwan or other issues. Um, so there has been at an elite level as well as at a public level, there's been a, quite an impressive amount of, uh, of, uh, of cohesion and of movement on the, the Chinese issue. Uh, which is quite surprising if you look back. I mean, I, you know, it's something which I, I look at on a daily basis and we've had a lot of very, very fractious uh, discussions around China within an EU context. Sometimes uh, the EU has been completely crippled by the divisions which they had with statements being either watered down or blocked um, about territorial disputes in the in the South China Sea and East China Sea, etc. But but um, it's interesting how much uh, the COVID response has changed people's attitudes and le has led to a kind of growing realism and a, a, a big coming together. I mean, there's still obviously big differences within the EU and our polling did show that in Italy and in Bulgaria, for example, people are less critical of, of China than they are in, uh, you know, in, in France or Germany. But compared to where we were a year or two ago, I think there's already been quite a, a lot of convergence. Carolina, I have a special question for you. Which, uh, is it actually, online? Has, uh, was sent has it been to me by, by uh, 
one of my listeners, and it, it doesn't have it, it it doesn't deal directly with COVID, but I think it does deal with COVID as well. Uh, and I would like to talk about the rule of law. We are in a country which is very much affected by it, and according to all available data. Uh, there is, a, there is a worsening of the rule of law in countries like Poland or, or Hungary. Nobody debates that. It, 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 and it is mentioned by VDAM, by Economic Intelligence Unit and all other polling institutions. But having said that, social studies as well show that majority of people within these states, within countries like Poland, for instance, are quite happy with the state of democracy. If you look at Cebos, for instance, it shows that the majority of Poles are happy with the state of democracy. We, we, believe to, we seem to believe that we're living in a pluralistic society. Uh, and, and uh, of course, 70% uh, of Poles actually think that they are having great lives. They are very happy with, uh, with the lives they're having. And the funny thing is, that the countries that see themselves as, this, as these deacons of the rule of law, they note uh, weakening of, uh, uh, su su of, of kind of support from the people. People questioned on the state of law of democracy in countries like France or Britain, they say that democracy has fallen down. How do you explain this paradox? And especially in the times of COVID, it is, uh, it may be uh, difficult for governments in, uh, in, in, in the countries that, uh, 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 that do not see the rule of law as a, as a problem mm -hmm. for themselves. Yes, thank you, Darius, for this wonderful question. I actually have started to think whether we have, uh, in the 30 years that is past us now in Poland, 30 years of, of democratic rule after 1989, have we ever actually defined what we mean by democracy in our society? Because mm. it seems that we uh, confuse democracy with the quality of living, which is of course much better You're today happy. Than, 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 than it has, it has been 30 years ago. But it also could, could be someone, something else. You know, I have been uh, s uh, looking at, at, at the today's panel and, uh, uh, and uh, I kept thinking about technology uh, joining us today, making this forum possible. Of course, spoiling also things because uh, there were some, some technological uh, small uh, failures that always occur and which makes us think whether really technology helps us and helps our communication and democracy, et cetera, et cetera. And I kept thinking that the three panelists that are out of the Polish theater, out uh, uh, there in, 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 in where you are, in, in, in Milano, in, in possibly in Berlin, uh, uh, and, and, and possibly in Stockholm, that you also, you all have behind you white doors. And this is extremely important because uh, I, I kept thinking once, uh, one thing is that, of course, what we show behind us is nowadays in the, in the conferences that, that we organize. This is a, 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 a statement about our personality or the organization we, we, uh, we represent. But there is also something else. I kept thinking about the German sociologist Georg Siemel, who wrote uh, the essay which is called Door and Bridge. What does actually door mean? Door is a process of being changed. Door is a process of going from one place to another, just like a bridge, going through the process without even knowing yet what awaits us at the, at the, at the, at the other side. And I do believe it's extremely important to, to mention this when we discuss COVID and how it affects democracy, because actually, even though we are extremely impatient to say what is on the other side, what awaits us in a year, in two years, in three years, we actually are only capable of describing the process that we are going through. So we actually can, can ask only questions about the process, what actually is, 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 is happening with us. And I just wanted to, to point at three possible questions. So firstly, 
I do believe that, that, that COVID is, is actually uh, not something that, uh, that changes democracy. It is rather a kind of catalyst. So it basically makes processes and, and, and phenomena that were already present more visible. So what could the, 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 the processes and phenomena be here? Polarization and our, uh, uh, the, 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 the change of the public debate, which is being done by the social or anti-social media, if you prefer. This is, of course, one thing. The other thing is, is some, somehow very much mentioned by, by Mark Leonard, and I would like to, 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 to use the same tone when I say that emotions in politics and how they are being played and manipulated and engaged by politicians. This is the second thing. The third thing, uh, something we, we wrote uh, together with Jaroslav Kuis about, namely populist statement and how the illiberal populists are actually using, manipulating the media in order to be attractive, to be heard in the chaotic uh, uh, sphere uh, of, of, of public de debate that we, are, that we are having today. So this would be the first question. So of what is COVID-19 a catalyst of those pro processes, perhaps of, of something, something more? The second question is, of course, um, who at the end of the day, at, at the end of today, who has a stronger agenda? Because uh, again, as it was already mentioned in the in 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 the uh, in the uh, panelists' um, statements before, um, the agenda of illiberal populists were was to a great extent reactive. So it was reactive. It was this politics of envy that Mark has mentioned. It was based on comparison. It was based on resentment. resentment towards the liberal edits. But at least in my country, and I do believe in many other countries too, the illiberals today are being pushed and stressed on how, how much their agenda is actually worth. Namely, um, when uh, law and justice came to power uh, with all those slogans of criticizing liberals, they were convincing perhaps five years ago. But with COVID-19 pandemic, they, they ceased to be. Uh, convincing and I think it's extremely important because the question is whether the liberals will be now capable of creating uh, a picture a portrait of future which is not filled with dark depths but is rather a source, source of hope at the end of the day the, the, the those who, who find the way to, to, to spread hope will will uh, will manage to, to, to hold on political power too and very, very, uh, very uh, shortly, the third question uh, is about the dim online and, and how much, to what extent, what we have now in, in, in Internet, this crowd of debates, of debating, of discussing democracy, can it actually be a replacement of a robust public square? Um, you, you know, in, in Siena, you have this famous Lorenzetti's uh, fresco, uh, which is co called the fresco of good and bad government. And the fresco of good government is filled with people. It is a square which is filled with people. There are even people dancing there. By the way, the dancers are being interpreted from, from time to time as uh, judges. Mm -hmm. not, not women dancing, but rather judges dancing to the rule of law. So. Um, the question is, to, to, to what extent, when we have the lockdowns, when we have only silence in the streets, then can the demon line replace the robust public square? Well, thank you, Carolina. W one thing which, uh, uh, which Carolina mentioned, which I think is worth, uh, worth pursuing, is uh, how do liberals stop talking to themselves? Uh, how uh, do liberals get out of this uh, idea that politics is about morality and nothing else? Uh, it, we, we are, obviously, we are in a country which is run by a party which in the West is called uh, a populist party and is regarded as, a, as, a, as probably is this uh, uh, example of democratic backsliding uh, 
we are within a society which is deeply divided, more or less half and half, and which doesn't talk to each other. Mm. Well, the, 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 these parts don't talk to each other. And which is also a, a case within a, many other societies. Uh, if you look at British society and, and some other societies in Europe as well. Uh, how do you... Uh, how, how do you deal with it? I mean, is it, is, it, is it doable with what we've gone through over the last decade, basically? And perhaps I would la uh, like Professor Matei to answer that question because she comes from a country which, after a lot of turbulence, uh, seems to have settled, or am I wrong? Um, I think, well, um, let's start from the last uh, point you made as, as, as the Italian political scene or uh, system as it settled. Well, I think actually um, probably Matteo Salvini, who is the leader of the Northern League Party, um, which, is the, uh, which is an anti-immigrant uh, populist party, exemplifies, I think, quite well and illustrates the difficulties that populists, well, in Italy, but also elsewhere in Europe, and I think Germany is quite a very interesting case as well. I'm sure Anna can talk to about this much more than I can. But it seems to me that Europe's far right populist in many countries like Italy or Germany stumbles and has been punished at a, a recent election. We've had uh, in Italy recently um, regional uh, elections. Uh, and I think the, there is, I would say it's quite um, clear and not ambiguous that um, the decisive factor that the populist uh, party is declining in public support. Um, and uh, Matteo Salvini himself, as a leader, has actually lost a lot, a lot of a significant public uh, appeal, um, public opinion uh, support. Um, the Northern League, this populist party, um, remains, by the way, um, the single most popular party in Italy. Okay, so I'm not suggesting that we have settled in a sense that it's the end of populism. I think I wouldn't go that far, quite the opposite. I think it's premature um, to be, uh, to be uh, thinking about, about that. And, um, but I think we can say that he, the unstoppable momentum uh, of the Northern League has now slowed and stopped. Um, and I think this is at the height, you know, of the pandemic. Um, his Salvini's daily social um, media uh, slogans against, for instance, illegal migrants coming from Africa and um, arriving in Italy in 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 the Mediterranean uh, southern coast. Well. Um, was just not attracting attention anymore. So the anti-immigrant narrative that he kept using also during the pandemic with stereotypes about, you know, the migrant being um, the, the problem bringing COVID to the country. Well, actually that didn't work uh, any longer. Um, and even his criticism, strong criticism against the government, against the prime minister, has definitely failed to land. So I think we can, I mean, I, I agree, actually, I think Mark Leonard, I mean, spoke about this democratic spring. So I, I'm, you know, some of the electoral results and, and the fall of uh, the Northern League uh, leaders, um, public support gives us some uh, indication that uh, populist as, you know, is, is, is definitely slowing down. But I think what is crucial, uh, I think it will be how the mainstream parties now deal with the second wave. I think this is really 
in my view, a very, very critical um, point. Uh, I think it's, again, it's too early, premature, to suggest that um, in Italy, at least, or in Germany, we see the end of populism. I think it all will depend on how governments, incumbent governments, manage and, and um, deal with um, the real challenges ahead. The healthcare emergencies, I mean, we, we're all aware of the number of cases of COVID rising exponentially in some countries, um, but also with unemployment, with the loss of jobs, and uh, which will uh, lie ahead. I've seen prediction of one million Europeans being unemployed. I hope it's not um, correct, but it is, I am very quite worried about the social unrest that uh, may um, destabilize, you know, uh, these these political systems. Uh, could you pick up on that, uh, and especially maybe when should liberal governments turn from restrictions to actually allowing people to, uh, uh, well, exp not only express their uncertainty about the, 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 their life, as a matter of fact, uh, and their employment and their quality of life. Uh, but also, sh when should liberal parties or should liberal parties who run some places in Europe, uh, how should they respond to this tension between safety and, uh, and uh, not only freedom, but freedom to to, to, to participate in life in normal way, in or quasi-normal terms. So I think if we if we think about um, how what can we do sort of to stop populist or or as I would prefer to call them illiberal parties, yeah, so parties that are not clearly committed to to the norms that make democracy meaningful, then I think we have to sort of take the step back and think about okay, what what drives these parties, right? And Number one is uh, unhappiness with um, with uh, what democratic parties have on offer. Second is a salience, so an importance of their issues. And thirdly is then that they're themselves well organized and um, uh, and manage to to reach to convince voters with their ideas. And I think in all three uh, all three areas uh, we can uh, we can address them and we can also beat them. The first of all. Uh, the important point, of course, is um, to start on the top um, to as democratic parties, as democratic politicians, to make a convincing offer, both in the style um, uh, that is addressing people uh, with uh, with their problems, with their fears, with empathy, um, with the right words. Uh, secondly, then, of course, also to uh, to demonstrate that democratic policies are the solutions or have solutions for the huge crisis of this world, COVID-19, climate crisis, inequality, uh, uh, the um, uh, migration, uh, all these issues that there are solutions exist. And just as a, as a sort of a, a footnote, uh, this is a point that's really important to me. We've just finished a study clearly showing that those governments that restrict democratic standards in order to fight COVID-19, on average, do not have better outcomes in terms of COVID-19 mortality. So this whole narrative that you need to restrict democracy in order to have successful policies is nonsense, yeah? uh, 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 particularly when it comes uh, to COVID-19, but I could bring examples from other areas as well. So number one, good policies, that's, that's the answer. The second one is the salience of the issues. And I think here I was really inspired again uh, by uh, the talk uh, from Jan Werner Müller. As liberals, we should not sort of, as we would say in German, put on all the shoes that they give us, right? I, I'm not really sure what the saying in English is, but sort of, you know, if, if they say, okay, you liberals, you cause the dissatisfaction yourself by doing this and that, and by, by focusing 
uh, on 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 certain issues and 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 then sort of we we jump on 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 the battles where illiberals want to have us i think that's exactly the wrong uh, the wrong response on the contrary we have to think about what are topics uh, where we can win uh, inequality for example i think here uh, many democratic parties have much better offers uh, than um, than illiberal ones uh, and sort of not to not to to um, uh, to give uh, their issues more uh, more salience, more relevance, like immigration on on the public space. The third one, and and here again, we've we've conducted um, also a study of what uh, led far right uh, illiberal parties uh, to lose uh, vote shares around Europe uh, during the last twenty years, and it's very clear that in almost all these cases are linked to. Uh, internal failures, internal uh, scandals and um, divisions of uh, these parties. And these are, of course, uh, things that liberal parties uh, and actors with uh, smart, uh, smart way of acting can, um, can encourage by, uh, by sort of um, actually um, presenting a, a litmus test uh, to these parties. I mean, this is also what the Republicans in the United States face, face right now, sort of clearly to, sh to, uh, to make it clear that, that sort of what, it, uh, what the whole package, the whole chain of, of a democratic choice entails, that it also includes uh, free media, um, uh, freedom of, of the judiciary and the such, and then to really uh, get them to um, um, to uh, uh, to have to to vote on this in parliaments, for example, and to position themselves. I think that's one, and sort of to try to demask uh, them um, uh, their uh, idea of pretending to be actually Democrats, while in reality they want uh, want and work to undermine democracies. Paulina, you you mentioned that we are in the process, and you very rightly mentioned that we are in the process, we don't know very much. We don't know very much about the virus, as a matter of fact, mm. and we don't know very much mm. about how to deal with it. But still, as, as our panel shows, we know quite, uh, quite a lot, as a matter of fact, and at least we, we feel uh, the, the tendencies that, that arise. Uh, What's what's the future? I mean, how how do you see the the development? And of course, I'm not talking about the the way the the pandemic is going to develop, but I'm talking about the, the what's your hunch about the politics of it, uh, especially in countries in which the tensions are getting higher and higher, like our country, for instance. But not only uh, uh, we are seeing what's going on in France at the moment, where there is this mixture of social issues and COVID mm. pandemic in a very turbulent mixture, as a matter of fact. Uh, do you see that as a way to, to, that the world is going to go for another few months? Well, the world is going to, to go on like this for another a few years, at least, I believe, because, because um, this is, is not, uh, this is not, uh, so to say, caused by the virus. I know that pandemic, when we think about pandemic, is actually, the association with pandemic is actually uh, chaos. So, um, but, but the, the problem is that the chaos is, has not been started by, by COVID-19. And surely uh, what has, the dramatic events in, in France has, have, have, have not started with, with COVID-19. So, so this, is, this, is one, uh, this is one thing. Now, um, we, we basically have to, to observe and be very aware what, what, is, what is happening to, to our democracies. Now, um, I think in, in Poland, but also in the US, it is very in, interesting to see that even though um, the politicians that we call liberals have been uh, uh, presenting some authoritarian streak uh, before COVID-19, what we see as a result of their actions during the pandemic, it's actually not that they are uh, bringing authoritarian rules here. They are actually bringing chaos. So I think it's extremely important to grasp this moment because this is ex exactly when we start to see that there is a deep 
difference between authoritarian regimes like China, for example, and illiberal, chaotic regimes, anarchistic regimes, because, because I do believe what actually the illiberals are doing to the state, to, to, to state, they are anarchizing it, anarchizing it. So, so th this has been, uh, this, ha this has started to be visible and I do believe it's extremely important. And now, uh, last but not least, I will just say that um, we are actually very much crowded now in the public uh, debate, in the internet, I've mentioned it already before. But the challenge for the liberals um, uh, remains the same. Issues-based uh, agenda, of course. Putting, uh, thinking about democracy into flight mode from time to time, of course, yes. But there is one more thing that the liberals actually have to do also. They have to be more enter entertaining even though the pandemic is here. So it's, it's, uh, it, it's extremely important that the liberals start to understand that not only that the populists do, they, do not have the, the monopoly on being entertaining. Liberals must be entertaining too, and I do believe this is the challenge for, for the next few months and the next few years. Uh, and on that though, um, unfortunately we have to end also for uh, for COVID reasons, because of the restrictions of, of, of the way that we use the, uh, the theater, uh, where, we, where we are guests, obviously. Uh, that was the second part of Warsaw European Forum's Freedom in Turbulent Times, Pandemic Liberalism and the Future panel. Thank you very much, all the participants, Professor Paola Mattei, Mark Leonard, uh, Anna Lurman, Carolina Vigura. Thank you very much. You can listen and you can view all the recordings from the forum on culturaliberalna.pl and on Facebook page of Cultura Liberalna as well as their YouTube's channel. Thank you very much.